In this program, I'm searching for this wonderful mineral, galena, lead. And I'm looking for the lost landscapes of the lead miners, just one of the northeast's many forgotten minefields. This is the North Pennines, Upper Weardale, Teesdale, Allendale, Swaledale. There are those who call this area England's last wilderness. It certainly looks wild enough and empty enough and beautiful enough. You could get the impression, if you didn't know the place, that nobody has ever lived here but a few hardy farmers and that nothing has ever disturbed the tranquility but the cry of curlews and lapwings. It seems, in fact, unspoilt and only touched by man with the lightest of touches. Wrong. Very wrong. For hundreds, no, more, for thousands of years, this beautiful area was a hotbed of mining and industry. There was coal up here and iron and all sorts of minerals. But most of all, there was lead. And I'm going to explore how they mined it, what they did with it, and how the miners lived in this wild and beautiful area. And personally, I can't think of a better place to start the story than here at Killop. Killop is a marvellous museum right up at the head of Weirdale. This was a mine, a real mine called Park Level Mine, which opened in the 1860s and closed 30 or 40 years later, but miraculously survived, enough to be restored anyway. And this is the mine itself. In some places you might call this an adit, a horizontal tunnel into the mine. Here they call it a level, though you can see from the way that the water's pouring out that it isn't actually level. It's deliberately cut on a slope so that it can act as a way of draining the mine as well as being a way in. The entrance here was horseshoe shaped because this was a horse level. Park level is a big mine so the entrance had to be big enough for horses to pull wagons through. And it's just ideal, wide enough for horses, but apparently tall men had to bend over. But fortunately, nobody has ever accused me of being a tall man. I can't even begin to imagine the effort involved in cutting a tunnel like this through solid rock, or the skill. How on earth did they get the direction right, or the sides so true? In the dark, too, or nearly dark, with nothing but picks and shovels. What happened down here, originally, I mean, millions of years ago, was that water heated to very high temperatures by hot rocks deep underneath the earth, and rich in minerals which had dissolved out the surrounding rocks forced itself up through the cracks and the faults of the overlying rock, and as it cooled, as it got colder, it deposited all of its minerals on the walls of the cracks. Some of the cracks where the lead is found were horizontal. They were known as flats. And where there were flats, the miners were able to work out sideways from the level. Some of the mines in this area had very rich flats of lead ore, but more typical of lead mines were the vertical or nearly vertical cracks coming up from deep down under the earth towards the surface. And they were called veins. The veins could be anything from a few millimetres thick to a few metres, and it was the job of the miner to follow the vein upwards through the roof as far as he could go. But fortunately, it's not my job, since I'd rather chew off my own leg than spend day after day up in that darkness. But then, I've never been a brave man. <laughs> 
Park Level, like so many of the mines in this area, was a very remote place. We're a long way above sea level, and it's pretty cold and wet, and we're a long way from any towns or even villages, so there was no easy place for miners' families to live around about. So what happened was that lots of the mining companies built lodging houses for the miners to stay in during the week. They were called mine shops for some reason that I've never actually grasped, and this is one. <laughs> Cozy enough now, lovely roaring fire, but apparently these were really disgusting places. Men and boys slept together in here, they ate in here, they even cooked all of their food in this tiny little space. No, apparently these were filthy and horribly overcrowded, badly ventilated, rat infested, pongy, as only men and boys' rooms can be. Ugh. The most obvious thing at Killup is the water wheel. By the 1860s, when this mine was built, the vast majority of mines and factories elsewhere in the country were powered by coal-fired engines, but up here, coal was rare and expensive to transport, but, well, it probably comes as no surprise to Northeasterners, but we do have plenty of water. It keeps on falling from the sky, so all you need to do is catch enough of it and channel it to mighty wheels like this, and you've got enough power to drive the engines which crush the lead ore into manageable and bite-sized chunks. This is where they caught the water. There were miles and miles of little streams built and carefully maintained all over the hills to bring water to these reservoirs and to ensure a steady and reliable source of power to the wheel down there. So that's Killop. Well, part of it anyway. I've missed out loads. That's the trouble with television. You never get as much time as you want. But from up here, you can see that this place was part of a much wider mining landscape. That's another mine shop, for example, on the hillside over there. And everywhere you look, you can see grassed over old spoil heaps. Those small buildings on the hill over there, they were gunpowder stores. After an act of parliament in 1872, it was illegal to keep gunpowder close to people. Do you know, it fascinates me. When you really start looking, this area is absolutely laced with evidence of former mining activity. This place was my first contact with the lead industry. I'd come here oh, about 30 years ago with a party of school children on a trip from Felling uh, on Tyneside, which is where I used to work. And we came down here for a bit of an explore. A beautiful place, as you can see. I remember seeing a dipper, one of those little black and white birds that walk under the water. She seemed to have a nest just at the side of the waterfall. Just a beautiful place then. Northeastern nature at her finest, and you can't say fairer than that. But then we came on this odd little spot. Actually, it was more overgrown then, wilder. It's been tidied up a bit since. We hadn't a clue what they were. They were ruined something or others, but we had no idea what they were for. They all felt vaguely industrial in a mysterious sort of way, but uh, I know well enough now, of course, that was obviously the mine shop. It's just like the one at Killop. And there was an engine over here. I'm quite sure that there was an old engine over here. It had a nameplate on it of an engineering works in Gateshead. That's been taken away since. I, I'm sure it was here, though. Perhaps these iron bits were attached to it. Mm -hmm. 
This was the wheel pit where a water wheel as mighty as the one at Killop would have sat. Whatever all of these ruins were, there was something epic about them. The stonework was mighty. What giants, we asked each other naively, had created it and what for? But this was the giveaway. We realised that this was a shaft, a mine shaft. The kids were hugely excited. They wanted to climb over and have spiffing adventures and we had to drag them away bodily. And then I found this. We were just scrabbling around in heaps of old stone on the ground. And I found this, this actual lump. I've kept it ever since, and I loved it instantly. This smooth, shiny, metal-y stuff. I loved the weight of it. It's quite unexpectedly heavy. I recognised what it was immediately. Lead ore, Galena. Farewell to pleasant Dilst oh, you catch me humming an old Northumbrian folk song about the Earl of Derwentwater from Dilston near Hexham, who was executed for taking part in the Jacobite Rebellion of 1715, and rather bizarrely, his lands were given to the commissioners for Greenwich Hospital, who uh, built this remarkable chimney as part of the lead works that they built here at Langley in 1768. The smelter closed down in 1887 and it's entirely disappeared now, though its reservoir is still big and impressive. And of course, this spiffing chimney still stands as well. This was built in 1859 and it's a hundred feet high. It was built by a man called Nicholas White, who went on strike for two years for an increase in wages, which he eventually got, finished the chimney and a very nice job he made of it. But what on earth is it doing all of the way up here? two miles at least from the rest of the mill. Well, what a remarkable story this is. It's connected to the smelting mill by a flue. All chimneys have got to have flues that snaked up the hillside. And this is it. I'm walking on it now. The flue is underneath my feet. Like all flues, its purpose was to take away the fumes and the gases from the fire down below. Lead was particularly dangerous as far as fumes were concerned, not only because it's a really poisonous heavy metal, but also because it contained lots of sulphur dioxide, which often turned into sulfuric acid. People used to say that the flues and the chimneys were built to carry the fumes away from the workers and from their families. There's a break in the flue here, so if I pull out my trusty beacon, I can delve in a little way, but... People no longer think, you see, that this was built to protect the workers. Nowadays, they reckon that as the fumes rose up the flue, they cooled and deposited all of their minerals, their poisonous lead and so on, onto the surface of the cold stone. And periodically, that meant that you could send small boys up the flue to scrape it all back off again. And presumably, of course, breathe in the dust and die at an early age. But still, never mind, at least you weren't wasting any lead, eh? So that was nice. There was a number of key companies that owned and organised the lead industry in the North Pennines. I was just talking about Greenwich Hospital back there, and another of the biggest owners were a group called the London Lead Company, whose headquarters were at Middleton in Teesdale. But this is Allen Heads. Allen Heads was built as a mining village in the early 1800s to work the vast mines which lie underneath my feet. It was built by the mine owners W.B. Lead. W stands for Wentworth and B for Beaumont. The Wentworth Beaumonts were the lords of Allendale and they owned all of the mines up here. There are great things still here. This is the shaft, for example. It led down to five different levels. Now, there was no cage or winding gear to get the men down. They had to climb down ladders. 240 feet, that's 80 yards deep. That's a whole lot of ladders. Horses had to get down into the mine as well, but you'll be surprised to discover that they weren't quite so good as coping with the old ladders as the miners were, so they had to make do with this instead. These railings represent the top of the horse incline, which spiralled down deep into the heart of the mine. Isn't that amazing? 
Those were the mine offices, very impressive, but sadly unused now. And this was the mine agent's house, very posh. This is Allen Heads Hall, which was built in 1847 by quite a famous architect called E.B. Lamb. It might be excuse for thinking that something this substantial was built for the owners, but no, this was the agent's house. A remarkable man, a remarkable engineer called Thomas Sopwith. He had a clock because he was absolutely meticulous about time. I'll give you an example. He built schools all over the place. He really believed in education. 90% of the population up here could read, which was far higher than in most parts of the country. Anyway, this is his Allen Head School up there on the hill, and I read an extract from his diary, which went something like, um, at nine o'clock, I employed, as I often do, my telescope to see the children going into school, which they usually do on the second. But one boy was about three seconds late. But it turned out that he'd been hindered by an older boy who is to come to my office to be reprimanded. The scale of all this, the schools, the neat little cottages all around, is an indication of just how much money there was in lead mining at its height. Unless, of course, you happened to be one of the workers. Ordinary people didn't make a lot of money out of mining. But the uncertainty of the life led to one of the most remarkable things about lead mining landscapes. And that is that loads of the miners lived a double life. They became what one book I've read called minor farmers. And the phrase applies however you spell the word minor. Because their farms, well, there are some examples of them down there. They were small holdings. The women would work them during the week when the men and boys were away staying in the mine shops. They were just tiny. 10 or 20 acres, with a hay meadow, a few cows, some sheep, a buyer to overwinter the cows, just enough to help out if mining was bad, and it often was. Some of the small holdings are quite curious buildings. This one looks relatively normal from the front, but walk around the back and you can see that the same building incorporated the farm buildings as well. How neat and compact is that? I wonder what such a cottage might have looked like inside in the heyday of lead mining. Burn in Upper Weirdale. It's very cosy, very pretty. But it also contains some things which I think are truly wonderful. You see, the veins and flats of the lead mines contained far more than just lead. As the ancient water cooled, it deposited on the walls all sorts of minerals. Minerals with extraordinary names like fluorite and sphalerite and burrito calcite. Extraordinary names, but even more extraordinary colours and shapes. Up here in Weirdale, miners used to carry off some of this unwanted glory and they developed an art which is quite unique to this area. Quite unique to Upper Weirdale, I think. They made spa boxes, beautiful miniature landscapes and dioramas made entirely out of mineral specimens. It's an art which is so rare and which I love so much that amidst all of the beauty and fascination of this gorgeous area, I'm going to make it a Grundy's Wonder. It's a funny thing about miners. Maybe it's a product of spending so much time underground, but they do seem to have an eye for beauty. Coal miners are famous for their gardens and allotments, their love of natural history, pigeons and racing dogs. Up here, it's spa boxes and religion, in particular, the Methodist religion that seems to satisfy that need for beauty. 
This is the High House Chapel at Isaac Burn. Actually, it's the museum that I've just been inside, but it's also an active Methodist chapel built originally in 1760. Now, that's quite a remarkable thing to say, because 1760 is very old for a Methodist chapel. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, didn't die until 1791, and to find chapels that he knew personally and preached at is, well, well it's very rare indeed. In fact, this one and another, the beautiful little chapel at Newbiggin in Upper Teesdale, are said to be the oldest Methodist chapels in continuous use. <laughs> I love Methodist chapels. In fact, I would like to marry a Methodist chapel. I love this one. There's a wonderful simplicity about Methodist chapels. They were built to preach in and to listen to sermons in. To climb up into the pulpit of a Methodist chapel is to feel a wonderful sense of power, Lord of all you survey. You could terrify people from up here. You could bore them rigid. The power is exciting. I love this room. I'd like to give it another Grundy's wonder. Um, would I be allowed to do that? Mm, don't think so. Oh, you are a hard man. Well, that just leaves the old crushing boot, but what on earth am I going to crush in this beautiful district? I know, I could crush old spoil heaps in the hope of finding more galena, more beautiful lead ore. 